Every week, Tyler gave the rules that he and I decided. Gentlemen, welcome to Fight Club. The first rule of Fight Club is, you do not talk about Fight Club. Second rule of Fight Club is, you do not talk about Fight Club. It's, we're talking about Fight Club, and you know what? Bring Tyler on. Bring him on. Bring him. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. I have a blue belt in Krav Maga. I don't think Tyler knows how to fight for real. Everybody and welcome to another episode of the Cinema Psych Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Alex Swan, and this is a little bit of an interesting episode. It's a, an experimental episode, I'll say. Uh, so I am recording this intro after the main episode has been recorded uh, because I decided that I wanted to do a stream uh discussion episode kind of mixture kind of thing so what i did was i uh if and if you're not aware i stream on twitch under the name uh cog psych prof and um i just wanted to have a discussion about uh the the film uh with people on chat and maybe maybe that would have been fun uh, maybe that would be an interesting kind of interaction with other people for an episode because really <clears throat> I haven't been able to do a, an episode that I've wanted to do for um, about a year now, which is uh, have a roundtable discussion. And that is because everything has been canceled. So because of the pandemic, of course. And and so I this was kind of bridging the gap uh, with that desire and what else might be entailed with that so it will be a solo episode as i've done in the past with the show but it will also be a uh, kind of a mixture of who am i talking to what am i talking about uh, that kind of thing it, it the flow will be a slightly different flow than some of my previous solo episodes so uh, I hope you like it, and uh, without further ado, I will pass it off to me. All right, so welcome to the show, everyone, and I'm really hoping we get some audience participation in this one because i think this is a fun one to have audience participation and it's been out for a while it's been out for a while 21 years now uh so fight club was a novel written by chuck Palahniuk. i think that's how you say it Palahniuk. uh and it was directed by david fincher and david fincher is known for his moody dramas uh with a little bit of flavor and flair known for his moody dramas, starring, starring really only three main characters and then a couple of bit parts here and there. Uh, so starring Ed Norton, Ed Norton, in I think a role that potentially he was uh, robbed of the Academy Award of because he is phenomenal in this movie. He is phenomenal in this movie. Also stars Brad Pitt at the height of his powers. Uh, Brad Pitt playing a character uh, that when you watch it the first time, you're like, wow, I I kind of want to be like that guy. Uh, but then you realize, well, oh, no, maybe I don't want to be like that guy. Uh, so so Ed Norton plays the narrator uh, who affectionately calls himself Jack. Uh, whether or not that Ed, that's Ed Norton's character's name, whether that's the name of the narrator is ambiguous and is uh, appropriately so ambiguous. Okay. 
Uh, now, you can even see here in the casting notes that uh, he is given the credit of the narrator. So, I am Jack's unrelenting whatever. I am Jack's insert here, insert quote here. Uh, that is a play on the situation. That is a play on the situation. Uh, has nothing to do with his actual name, even though people like to call him Jack. I saw when I was putting my notes together for this episode, I sort of... Uh, I, I, I ran into a number of sources that were talking about this that called him Jack, and I was just like, what are you even doing? No, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be ambiguous, and you're just like, what are you doing, guys? Yeah. Uh, and then the last main character, I would say, She's actually down the list here because I think it's in order of who is seen um, uh, in uh, order of appearance here. Marla Singer. Marla Singer played by Helena Bonham Carter. Okay, I think I said that. There we go. And uh, Brad Pitt plays Tyler Durden. I don't know if I said that or not, but he plays Tyler Durden. And um, and then Meatloaf makes a, a... a bit, he has a bit part. He plays um, Robert Paulson, uh, Bob Paulson. Uh, he goes by Meatloaf a day in the movie, which I think a day is his last name. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and then a bunch of uh, random people are in it. But what my favorite random person in it is actually, uh, is he credited? I don't know if he's credited. This is first build only. I could go to the full cast. But Jared Leto's in this movie, a very early role for Jared Leto, um, who I think the next year gets his breakout performance in a Requiem for uh, in Requiem for a Dream. My goodness, he looks crazed in this film. He is he is very crazed, and but still. It's still a great character. It's still a great character, even though he has like what three lines or something like that. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, can't fault him for that. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in this movie. There's a lot going on in this movie. And one of the things that uh, I am going to focus on in this episode is the narrator's potential mental health issues. Uh, I think that's the strongest aspect of psychology that that we can talk about. And it's. But the funny thing is, is that even though that's it's the most psychological. Aspect of the movie, it's actually and the book, it's actually not that necessary for the story, if that makes any sense, like it's kind of. It's secondary to some of the other themes and messages that are present in the film. So here is my major spoiler alert. Major, major, major spoiler alert. Um, I'm going to ruin the film for you if you haven't seen it, um, which will change the way that you watch it the first time, which is unfortunate, but, you know, it's been out for 21 years, so why haven't you gotten on it? is kind of uh, my rationale for just going out and spoiling movies. <laughs> you know, that sort of, that old chestnut of ruining movies for people. So let's get the, let's get the major spoiler out of the way immediately. The major spoiler out of the way immediately is Tyler Durden's not real. Uh, and it is apparent throughout the movie that there are two ways we can think about Tyler Durden, but the fact of the matter is, is he is the narrator. Tyler Durden is the narrator. Now, Tyler Durden is not the narrator's name, real name. We don't, like I said, we don't know the real name of the narrator. We only know that he made some sort of persona 
or identity or something or Tyler is a hallucination. But the fact of the matter is Tyler's not real. Tyler is not real. Once you watch it again, so if you watch it one through one way through and you kind of didn't know that, it's kind of mind blowing when you get to the motel scene and uh, the narrator doesn't know what's going on. And then finally, he just yells Tyler and Tyler appears in the hotel room sitting in the chair and he has to explain it to him. He's like, I don't understand what's going on. And Tyler says, you haven't gotten it yet. You haven't figured it out yet. What is the matter with you? What did you just say? What is wrong with you? What did you just call me? Say my name. Tyler Durden. Tyler Durden, you freak. What's going on? I'm coming over. No, wait, wait, Marla, I'm not there. You broke your promise. Jesus, Tyler. You can talk to her about me. Tyler, what the f*** is going on here? I ask you for one thing. One simple thing. Why do people think that I'm you? Answer me! Shit. Answer me, why do people think that I'm you? I think you know. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Why would anyone possibly confuse you with me? I, I, I don't know. You got it. No. Do not fuck with us! Say it. Because... Say it. Same person. That's right. We are the all singing, all dancing crowd. I don't understand this. You were looking for a way to change your life. You could not do this on your own. All the ways you wish you could be, that's me. I look like you want to look. I fuck you want to. I am smart, capable, and most importantly, I'm free in all the ways that you are not. Oh no. Tyler's not here. Tyler went away. Tyler's gone. What? what? People do it every day. They talk to themselves, they see themselves as they'd like to be. They don't have the courage you have to just run with it. Naturally, you're still wrestling with it, so sometimes you're still you. We should do this again sometime. Other times, you imagine yourself watching me. If this is your first night at Fight Club, you have to fight. Little by little, you're just letting yourself become Tyler Durden. And sort of beats him over the head with it. Uh, he uses that information to his favor at the end of the movie where he seemingly shoots himself in the head in order to stop Tyler from enacting, carrying out the main plan. I I, I think Tyler could, could return. And I think Chuck Palahniuk... Um, wrote two other fight club novels following the following the initial the initial one from the 19 1990s yeah i think i think that's the case so the psychology of the narrator is where i want to pivot to um now that we know that tyler isn't real i think that one is on I think that one is on a t-shirt, the t-shirt that spoils everyone. So I think Tyler Durden isn't real is or it's it says something like the narrator is Tyler Durden or something like that or Tyler, Tyler Durden isn't real, something like that. Um and he doesn't sell soap. It's just a it's a metaphor. It's an important metaphor, but it's a metaphor. No soap. Okay. So Something's up with the narrator in this movie. Something's up with the narrator. So he starts out his, well, after the intro scene, I'll say, it pivots to a time previous. We're not given a, we're not given that information. It just pivots to a time previous to the events that start the film, which technically are the, is the end of the film. Um, where he's having an argument with Tar- with Tyler. 
So the narrator starts the film out and he's uh, laying awake in bed. And he says he hasn't slept in six months. That's rough. He hasn't slept in six months. Uh, first of all, that level of insomnia is literally, literally, and figuratively impossible. So he literally can't be not having slept for six months. That's what that's that's wild. It's wild. I think it's wild. For six months, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. With insomnia, nothing's real. Everything's far away. Everything's a copy of a copy of a copy. When deep space exploration ramps up, it'll be the corporations that name everything. The IBM Stellar Sphere. The Microsoft Galaxy. Planet Starbucks. I'm gonna need you out of town a little more this week. We got some red flags to cover. It must have been Tuesday. He was wearing his cornflower blue tie. You want me to deprioritize my current reports yeah. until you advise of a status upgrade? Make these your primary action items. Here's your flight coupons. Call me from the road if there's any snags. He was full of pep. Must have had his grande latte enema. Like so many others, I had become a slave to the IKEA nesting instinct. Uh, yes, I'd like to order the Erica Picari dust ruffles. If I saw something clever, like a little coffee table in the shape of a yin-yang, I had to have it. The Klipsk personal office unit, the Hovatrek home exerbike, or the Ohanashov sofa with the string green stripe pattern. Even the Rizlampa wire lamps of environmentally friendly unbleached paper. I'd flip through catalogs and wonder what kind of dining set defines me as a person. I had it all. Even the glass dishes with tiny bubbles and imperfections, proof that they were crafted by the honest, simple, hard-working indigenous peoples of wherever. I was holding. We used to read pornography. Now it was the Horchow collection. No. Okay, so insomnia. I've had an insomnia a couple of times in my life. Not a bunch. Not a bunch, and it's only lasted for like a, maybe a day or something like that. So not even close to six months. That's just that sounds awful, and it's also impossible. You'd be dead by then if you couldn't sleep until six months, uh, for for six months. Excuse me. Um. So Im- immediately, both Chuck Palahniuk and David Fincher are telling us that the narrator's mental state is wild it's not it's not meant it, it's not meant to be trusted we have to take it with a grain of salt in this case because you cannot have in some you cannot have six months with no sleep now you can have insomnia for six months off and on and maybe that is what they're trying to say but it really doesn't play out like that visually it plays out like the narrator hasn't slept in six months which is in which is insane which is crazy right you have to sleep uh there were there are some great sleep studies out there that really show that if you don't get REM if you don't get rapid eye movement sleep then um you are you are just you are just done uh lack of lack of cognitive res- resources uh no 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 good way to uh deal with all of the resources that you need so honestly at this point he could feel like uh uh you haven't slept for 6 months sassy helen welcome in by the way welcome in um good to see you again it could feel yeah it can feel like you haven't slept for 6 months if you have insomnia but i think there i think the way that it's written and the way that it's portrayed in the film is it's meant to be literal. Uh, it's meant to be literal in the sense that we shouldn't trust the way that um, he explains it. So I want to talk briefly about insomnia. So insomnia is an inability to fall asleep and or stay asleep. 
Okay, because so some people can fall asleep for maybe a little bit less than a 90 minute cycle and then they wake up and then can't can't go back to sleep or they'll do that many times per night. So there's two kinds of insomnia. Um, most of the people that I talk to who have insomnia tend to uh, have the first one, the first issue, which is they can't fall asleep. But once they do, whenever they do, they uh, can stay asleep. They can stay asleep. So, yeah. Yeah. It's it's rough. It's one of the rougher and more common sleep disorders that are out there. And there could be a number of reasons for it. Anxiety is probably the leading cause of insomnia. And especially the inability to fall asleep. I think that's that's generally speaking the leading cause because people's brains can't turn off. They they're they're amped from an amp. Uh, they they're amped. They just uh, they they keep going and they can't stop. And they're so the their brain just won't shut off. You know. It's sleep apnea is also very uh, common. Yeah, sleep apnea, waking every ten minutes. Yeah, that's rough. It's really rough. That's and that's that's going to be that's going to be just as detrimental as an insomniac who wakes up every ten minutes, right? Because the problem with sleep disorders is that it doesn't. None of them allow a person to get restful sleep, which your brain needs in order to function the next day and the next day and the next day, right? We, we evolved to sleep for seven to eight hours. We've evolved that way. It protects us because during that period of the night when it's the darkest, we need to... We need to hide. We need to make sure we're hiding. But now we have this uh, old brain in a modern society. We don't need to hide at night anymore. But we're still wired to sleep at night because we're diurnal animals. And now we just have modern problems. Recognized form of torture. Yep, sleep deprivation. You're right, Helen. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, preventing people to sleep. So there's a really great Demet, uh, Demet, can't say his name, Dement study. Um, one of the foremost minds on sleep and consciousness. So there's a really interesting study that I I tell my I tell every single student when I talk about sleep. So I talk about sleep in like three of my ten, three or four of my ten classes, and whenever I do. I tell them this one story. So there um, is dreams researcher, foremost researcher on dreams. Uh, The the guy that we got most of our information about what dreams are. So he had a bunch of people in a lab, a sleep lab. And he asked them to uh, be open to not being able to get a full sleep cycle. So that's what they participated in. They were going to get some sleep, but not a full sleep cycle. So they would get woken up at any point where their sensors on their face started detecting rapid eye movement. And so anytime somebody um started moving their eyes a lot while they were sleeping they were prodded awake they were forced to wake up and then they would go and do uh cognitive tasks like uh uh, uh, uh comprehension tasks uh word word completion sentence completion uh digit span all sorts of uh, a huge battery of tests a huge battery of tests and over a period of several days, these volunteers were not allowed to engage in rapid eye movement sleep. And you and and it was it was evident after the first day that not getting REM was 
highly detrimental to focus uh, and and cognitive ability. Their scores tanked on these cognitive battery tests. Tanked after that first day, and it was only it was it it only got worse after that. It only got worse after that. So the conclusion of this study was that we need rapid eye movement sleep to be able to handle cognitive information the next day and he uh, dement and uh, his co-authors argued that it seemed to be that most people were uh dreaming at that point too they were they self-reported that they were dreaming and finally what i think is most important is that if you prevent somebody from getting uh rapid eye movement sleep if you prevent that and you let them go to sleep and then you don't do any more prevention they will immediately go into REM sleep they will immediately go into REM sleep so the more you deprive them of REM the more their body wants to do it the faster its onset will be which is crazy because this is this is why this is 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 so uh, wild. This is why this this part of of biology is so wild. So, in order to do rapid eye movement sleep, you need to first go into deep sleep. You need to first hit stages three and four and come back up, and that takes time because you have to go from one to two to three to four, and you sit in those levels for a little bit. And so it takes time to get to REM, but the, the faster, the more you deprive it, the faster um, you drop from one to two to three to four back up to REM. So let's explore this idea of how to treat insomnia after a quick break. Hey, listener. Thanks for sticking around this episode. I hope you're enjoying it. Anyway, I need your help in growing this podcast's audience. In past episodes, I've asked you to share this podcast with five of your friends. Let's keep doing that. Share this podcast on social media, especially if you really liked an episode. Share that episode. Tell five of your friends or family if they have an interest in film or psychology, or even better, both. Growing the audience is our goal for the second year of programming. And so we need your help to get that done. Other ways to contribute to the podcast include tips to our PayPal, found on our website, becoming a patron at patreon.com slash cinema psych pod, rocking some sweet merch from our Spreadshirt shop, and or leaving us a rating or review on your favorite podcast service. Now back to the show. So how do we handle insomnia? Well, let's let's be let's be Jack's. Sorry. Let's be the narrator's therapist here. So most treatment is behavioral for insomnia. Um there aren't really very many drugs on the market for that kind of thing. So one of the things that uh, psychologists and sleep therapists will suggest to you is to create a bedtime routine. Don't deviate from that routine. Um, and after a few weeks, uh, your body will get what that routine is for. The other thing, uh, the other thing is make all your bed only for sleeping nothing else okay maybe sex but nothing else other than that nothing else under the that other than that so use your bed only for sleep uh and so you got to make that bedtime habit habitual okay so screens off an hour before bed 
read a book, especially one that you think you might be bored of immediately, right? These are very important sleep hygiene. Yeah. Yeah, Helen. These are very important sleep hygiene tactics. And uh, after a while, it could potentially benefit the insomnia in um, reducing it. So the other, uh, the other big elephant in the room is, okay, if Tyler Durden's not real, if Tyler Durden is not real, then what is the issue? What is the issue with Tyler Durden and the narrator who I have on screen right now? Right. So, so these are this is obviously a um, a Photoshop of the two of them together, uh, two sides of a coin or so, if if that's what you want to call it. So there are two two aspects of mental and psychological disorders that we could talk about here as to okay, well, if Tyler is fake. What, why, what is happening with the narrator? What is going on with the narrator? Well, uh, insomnia aside, but a potential cause of, uh, of Tyler Durden, we have two. We have dissociative identity disorder, which I'll talk about first. And then we have potentially schizophrenia, which I'll talk about second. So dissociative I- identity disorder, DID. And you may be familiar with it. Uh, it used to be called multiple personality disorder. Uh, there, there have been uh, there was one really famous case of Sybil uh, who claimed to have multiple uh, identities, uh, but it turns out she was lying. She was faking because she wanted to be a good patient for her uh, doctor. But uh, so that's Sybil. And then they've made a few movies about the sort of focusing on DID completely like Split, which came out a few years ago. Uh, and then um, Identity, which came out only a couple of years after this movie. So. Like four years, it came out in like 2003 or something like that. This came out in 1999. Fight Club came out in 1999. So DID explanation for Tyler's existence is it though okay so dissociative identity disorder is uh has two features to it um obviously a dissociative episode which is hallmarked by dis uh a depersonalization okay so you're moving your self-identity from that dissociative experience and then the derealization, where during the dissociative episode where you have depersonalized, you also do not realize and understand what you are doing in those situations. You are a almost a, a an astral projection outside of your body. And many people have have many people, the people who have who have been diagnosed with DID report this kind of like pulling away. But even people who don't have DID who just have go through dissociative episodes like dissociative um uh, uh fugue uh will report this like astral projection. I'm I'm looking at myself in the third person kind of uh, kind of way. And there are some clues throughout the film that point us to uh, that uh, Tyler is a distinct identity uh, that is separate and compartmentalized from the narrator. Okay. One of those scenes is when um, he's talking to Marla after uh, he, after Tyler and Marla have sex. He uh, he's talking to her and he's like, oh, I heard you guys last night. And she's confused. She's like, what are you talking about? And that was us. Um, but she wasn't she obviously wasn't using those words because then that would clue the, the viewer in that first time. You're not supposed to know until the one scene in the hotel room. You're not supposed to know until the hotel room. So. um, That's that's the first clue another clue is the uh scene where he fights tyler outside of the bar 
And that's another clue. Okay. And then they cut to that later in the film when Tyler is in the hotel room and he's telling him to think about think about our interactions. And they sh- they show the uh, fight scene and he's punching himself and two guys are are looking at them and then uh, they're talking after they have fought and he drops the in the earlier scene he's handing the beer bottle to Tyler but in, in actuality he just drops it on the ground and it shatters um, when he's pouring the lie on his hand that's also an issue right so th- those are some clues as far as being a having a distinct identity within the film of Tyler Durden. I think the one thing that gives it away with that it's not DID are some of the other things that actually point to schizophrenia. Uh, a couple of a couple of notes about dissociative identity disorder. One, it's super controversial on whether or not it actually exists. Super controversial. So I, you know, I, I'm not a clinical psychologist, so I don't really have a horse in that race. Uh, and because it's, and and part of the reason why it's so controversial is because it's so rare. The case studies that get published, uh, p- uh, independent reviewers, generally speaking, have a lot to say about whether or not that actually re- uh, reflects DID. But be that as it may, it is in the DSM-5, so it is part of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, of Mental Disorders, uh, uh, you know, the, the book that's produced by the American Psychiatric Association, not to be confused with the other APA, the American Psychological Association. So, is it real? Does the movie do a good job of portraying it if that is what we are going to diagnose the narrator with? Yeah, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. Uh because a clue um that kind of gives us away is that how the narrator and Tyler go back and forth with each other, especially the scene where they're conversing in the hotel room where it all just kind of gets laid out. That's, I think, the biggest piece of information because with DID, from as far as I'm aware, um, the the person who has the consciousness at the the identity that has the consciousness at the moment gets to spend quite a bit of time in that in that consciousness. It's not a back and forth like you see in the film, and it's very rare that the identities have a conversation with each other. Hey. It's very rare identities have a conversation with each other. And Split, I think, does does that right. Identity does not do that right um, as far as what's going on subconsciously. And I think Fight Club sort of pulls you away from that di- quote-unquote diagnosis um, because uh, of that understanding with, with DID. So what else is it? What else is it? Well, it's the other option, as I mentioned, is schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a another uh, mental disorder in the DSM five. It's been around for a long time. It's been around for a long time. Uh, It is a psychotic disorder, whereas DID is a dissociative disorder. Uh, Schizophrenia is a psychotic disorder, and and so in calling it a psychotic disorder, it means that the foremost symptom for diagnosis is a break from reality, uh, which is the psychosis part, right? This is when a person just has a mental break from reality, okay? Uh, And then there are positive and negative symptomatology that uh, combine with this psychosis, so some positive symptoms include hallucinations. These are f- by far the most common uh, positive symptoms. So positive symptoms are called positive because they are additive symptoms. So they are not neurotypical and present themselves as part of the disorder. So hallucinations, 
auditory and visual, auditory and visual, uh, and the the other kind of positive symptom that's very common is uh, delusions, right? And delusions are false beliefs. Don't con- don't conflate the two. Don't don't mix and match them. So you can have a delusion about what your hallucinations are, but you cannot hallucinate a delusion. If that makes sense. Um, and one of the major, which has sort of been stigmatized, I think, in popular media, one of the main uh, delusions is paranoia, right? People are after me, that sort of thing. Is it schizophrenia? I don't know. Other other symptoms can be classified as negative. This is when you have subdued levels of neurotypical functioning as part of your symptoms. So one of those, I'm not going to go through all of them. One of those is something like flat affect. Okay, not expressing joy, sadness, fear, anger. It's just kind of flat, which would not be, which would not be neurotypical um, over an extended period of time. So not not just saying that it's that to have a flat effect is not neurotypical because you know sometimes you are flat. Uh, it, I mean, depends on the context for sure, but. Sometimes, yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting one. Again, I'm not a clinical psychologist, so these are just my understandings applied to how the film is being portrayed. Uh, Now, the evidence in the film for schizophrenia is fairly apparent in my view, but it's, it's still ambiguous and it's still vague whether or not it is. There's a lot of creative license for this one. Perhaps it could be both. Perhaps it could be both. I mean, schizophrenia is generally more, uh, generally more common than DID and there is no controversy around, controversy around schizophrenia. But the conversation that Tyler and the narrator have in the hotel room, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, I think really, really hits at home. Of course, when he first meets Tyler Durden, that makes sense. Okay, he has the his you know he has the briefcase, um, and he thinks that he left with Tyler's briefcase when in fact it was just his own briefcase. Uh, the when he is harming himself in his boss's office, so his boss will give him money without having. Uh, without having to work. And when he punches himself so hard that he flies back into the bookshelf, he's like, he pauses and he says, it took me back to my first fight with Tyler. It reminded me of my first fight with Tyler. I am Jack's smirking revenge. What the hell are you doing? Why would you do that? Oh my god. No! Please stop! What are you doing? Oh god, no, please! No! For some reason, I thought of my first fight with Tyler. No! Everything this man took for granted. Something horrible had been growing. Now look, give me the paychecks like I asked, and you won't ever see me again. And right then, at our most excellent moment together. Oh, thank God. Please don't hit me again. I, I think that hints at schizophrenia more than DID. 
more than DID. But it, it, it is interesting that um, Polaniak and Fincher were like, we're going to have creative license, so we're not going to stick to any one disorder. This could be insomnia, this could be DID, this could be schizophrenia, or it could be all three. It could be it could be insomnia induced dissociation. It could be insomnia induced schizophrenia. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that Tyler Durden does not exist, and how the narrator interacts with him is the product of a mind that is full of anxiety, full of doubt. Cynicism, pro capitalistic, anti capitalistic ideals that are at odds with each other. Who wins in that case? Who wins in that case? Well, Tyler wins in that case. He succeeds in blowing up the banks, getting Fight Club to actually become a cult. His name was Robert Paulson. His name was Robert Paulson. His name was Robert Paulson. Like, making these guys do anything after they join this fight club, it's it's wild. And the crazy thing about fight club is, is that it's not actually a club. It's not actually a club. It's more like a cult. You get to come and you get to beat the crap out of somebody in the basement of some warehouse. I don't know. I don't even know where. And you get the you you form this brotherhood and then you indoctrinate them. Indoctrinate them. And because they get to do the thing that they want to do, they uh yeah, it's wild. It's wild. Cult-like behavior. A couple of other things that I found interesting about this movie is obviously the anti-capitalistic theme. How does that apply now? 21 years later. I think it fits quite a bit. I think it's far worse than it ever was. Okay. Okay as far as capitalism is concerned, and there is a lot of anti-capitalistic uh, sentiment in the United States right now in a lot of Western countries. A lot of... A lot of it. Uh, Robert, what causes cult behavior? Uh, I would say uh, a lot of things. Uh, to, just to be sort of um, brief, because I, I, I don't know a lot about cults, but one of the things is... Um, a need to affiliate and belong. And when somebody is charismatic and tells you that they know exactly how you're feeling, you begin to trust them. And then they can tell you whatever you want. Whatever they want. Um, and you'll start believing it. Because you found your people, you found somebody that understands you, you found uh, a a calling in life, right? So this is why the Manson family existed. This is why um, Jim Jones was able to create his cult. This is what um, Heaven's Gate was all about. This is uh, Zoltan. From Dude Where's My Car, uh, Nexium, like all all of these called Scientology. <laughs> That's th this need to belong and find meaning in our lives. And when somebody's like, "Well, I've got the meaning. I've got the meaning for you," well, you're gonna be like, "Well, uh, I'm gonna tell me about it." Where do I sign up? And that's when you sign over your life savings to the Church of Scientology. And when you are uh, excommunicated, you are um, not not allowed to be. Um, you are a not a member of the church anymore. And you are not to be spoken uh, to by any other member of the church. Yep. You are. Dude, what does mine say? Oh, my God. 
Uh, finally, somebody gets my references. Sweet. What does mine say? Dude. What does mine say? Sweet. What does mine say? <laughs> oh my God. One of the best back and forths. I have. It's been a while since I've seen that movie. Sultan. So Tyler's blowing up. Tyler's blowing up these buildings because he's uh, anti-capitalist. And it's funny because they start the movie off with him going uh, going all uh, ham fist in uh, getting all of the IKEA furniture and buying <laughs> buying furniture from a catalog <laughs> from a catalog uh, on the phone. So mail order catalog, mail order furniture, uh, because this is before like the internet was super big. <laughs> I just thought it was super funny. Uh, mail order catalog, uh, buying furniture while he's sitting on the toilet. Uh, you know, uh, like we do now, but with the phone in our hand, right? What, like we do, it's a beep, 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 or boop. Hi, yes, I would like to buy a piece of furniture. You can just go to our website, sir. Um, how dare you? First of all, how dare you? Uh, and so you then, okay, fine, I'll go to the dang website and buy the furniture there. Thank you, fine, great, awesome. Couple of other things that I noted uh, that from the my last watching of this film, many uh, actually a few years ago. Um, there's a lot of subliminal messaging throughout the movie, so um, uh, I don't know. Uh, let's see, a Fight Club GIF, uh, Fight Club GIF. Um, because I, I don't want to show the, I can't show the movie and have the audio play on stream. But what I do want to do is uh, get the um, Fight Club GIF uh, secret frame. Oh, yep, there he is. See that? So they slowed down this clip. They slowed down this clip. There's Tyler. So it's a single frame. Which means you're you're uh, blink and you miss it, blink and you miss it. Okay, so that's the first. Okay, let's see if they have any more gifts of this, because there's also other ones. He's got his arm over him. Did you see that? He's got his arm over it. That's so good. That's so good. Fincher did a fantastic job with this. Right there, he is with his arm around it. And then here's another one where they're in the hotel room. Oh, he's right there. Okay. The narrator is watching. You can see Brad Pitt all the way to the right. Okay, I should read. No incoming calls allowed, but Tyler calls him from a payphone. Like, that's impossible, right? Crashes the car to teach him a lesson. Tyler gets out the passenger side and crawls over the car, pulling the narrator out of the driver's side. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. There's also one that there probably wouldn't show on a Business Insider Australia. And that is they snuck in a couple of naked women uh, where they're explaining the whole thing about film. And when you have to change a reel, there's a little burn thing in this in the corner uh, when movies had to get their reels changed <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> not these not these no fangle digital things out there, you know, the digital movies and the digital projectors, you know, them 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 them, them old style reels with film, you know. So, there was a there's a burn, there's a a marker in the corner and and I'm pointing to the corner of my box here because as the narrator is describing what Tyler does for a living, or not does for a living, he makes soap. Um, one of the things that he likes doing is he likes going and messing with uh, uh, the film reels, and he and he splices in frames of of nudity. And the the interesting thing is this is obviously a, a meta joke for the entire movie. It's a meta joke for the entire movie because David Fincher is doing that as well with Tyler Durden as 
as it's a single frame of Tyler Durden before and after the narrator meets him and he's slowly becoming part and more and more of his life. So he they they talk I I think that's a I think that's a lovely little easter egg. And uh yeah, I think it's a lovely little easter egg. I enjoy it. I enjoy it immensely. And that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, thanks for listening. If you've gotten this far, I appreciate you, uh, you know, indulging me on some random episode talking about Fight Club. I think I did a pretty decent job of comparing the two potential mental health issues that the film sort of brings to the fore and the you know, typical broad strokes that a film like this or a writer like Chuck Palahniuk would would uh would have to say I I didn't focus a lot on the materialism or the consumerism aspect of it because that's that's for a different podcast uh, I I'd love to talk about that for sure but that I think that's for a different podcast to be honest with you and so that's going to do it for this episode again I appreciate you taking the time out and uh, listening to this if you also came by the stream I appreciate that too and uh, until the next episode thanks for listening 